Morning, everybody. Dr. Gillard here for one last time. This is our last CVPP lab, so I hope everybody's doing well. It is part two of the lung examination, and unfortunately, I don't have PowerPoint slides. This is old school, just one big Word document, but we'll go through it. So here we go. All right, so we, last week we did the posterior chest examination. So this week we're going to do the anterior chest examination. And some of it's kind of the same as last week. This is, of course, the anterior chest right here. And you can see, and you can see we have an anterior chest here. Remember we have a manubrium, part of the sternum, the body of the sternum. Remember the angle of Louis? The angle of Louis runs right into the second ribs right here. Right. And um, yeah, we have the heart zone would be in here. Some the authors some authors say the heart, the area of cardiac dullness runs from the midclavicular line, the third intercostal space, down to the fifth intercostal space. That's kind of the area, the dull area, or the area of cardiac dullness. And that would be in the midclavicular line, right? So that should be dull because that's where the that's where the heart is. Uh, so some of the, the board books kind of split decision on wh whether we should even do percussion and even auscultation for breath sounds because it's hard to compare side to side when you have an area of dullness here. So Bates says to do it. Seidel says not to do it, so just in case they ask you that on boards, I better at least teach you how to do that. But that's kind of my my thinking on that. So the patient, again, we have kind of a split decision. The patient will, according to Bates, which is the oldest board book, the patient should be in a supine position. That's the way we're going to actually not do this. It's easier to to do this, actually, this, yeah, the patient is supine in this because we have to percuss. Uh, so we will, this is wrong, we will, and I can actually fix this, can I? Uh, we will be doing the exam in a supine position. Okay, but Bates says uh, that it should be in a supine position, or you could do it in a seated position if you want. Seidel says he wants you to do it in a seated position. If the patient is having trouble breathing, though, it's always e it's always easy, always easier for the patient, more comfortable for the patient to do it in a seated position. All right, but we're going to do it in supine position unless they're going to have trouble breathing. Patient or the doctor will be on the right as usual in a supine position. The only time the doctor is ever on the left side of the patient is for the seated portion of the pulmonary exam where you do stand on the left side and examine the patient's posterior thorax that way. The order is pretty much as always inspection, palpation, percussion, and then auscultation. So inspection, and that can be done over the, I don't think we really talked about that uh, for the anterior exam. So I threw this stuff in here because you do need to know this. So observation, uh, you just look at the shape, you look for, now this is not the cardiac inspections, for, so we're not looking for heaves or anything like that. We're just looking at the shape of the thorax. Remember normally the chest, the chest is, wider, I'll exaggerate it. Here's an overhead view of a person's chest. Should be wider in the horizontal range compared to the A to P range or the lateral, from lateral to medial, it should be wider. Uh, so this is the, here's the patient's head. There's their nose. Uh, so the ratio, they, they usually say the ratio is one to two a to P to lateral ratio, 
A to P to lateral thoracic diameter ratio is how it's called. If you want to get specific about it, it's 1 to 1.4 is average. That comes out to the, a ratio of 0.71. But in patients with C, COPD, uh, the ratio becomes closer to 1, uh, one to 1. So they get more of a, a barrel chest because of consolidation of lung tissue. Remember the alveoli, oh, I guess we haven't talked about lungs yet, but usually you have the acinus, terminal part of the acinus kind of looks like this. You have all these alveoli stuck together. But in someone with COPD, the walls become destroyed by inflammation. And these alveoli coalesce into one big group. And so you have something like this. And it's almost like a varicose vein. The It's not designed to be like this. So it, the kind of outer edge of it overexpands. And that causes the chest to overexpand as all those alveoli, let's say groups of 20 alveoli, coalesce into a single or maybe a double or a triple. As they kind of morph together, you get an expansion of the A to P ratio. And that, of course, is called a barrel chest. Barrel chest. Right? Oh, here's a picture of it. I forgot to put that in there. <clears throat> Everything I just said, you can see the normal ratio. We'll say 2 to 1. Most books say that. but uh, And then 1 to 1 ratio in someone with COPD. We also have to watch out for the rib cage deformities, the classic pectus carnatum, or the pigeon chest, versus the pectus excavatum, which is excavation. As you think of an excavator, how it digs. Um, it digs out the chest. So in pectus carinatum, the sternum is placed too far forward. So this would be a pectus carinatum in this design here. And then an excavator, if you thought of an excavator digging on the sternum, the, ch the sternum is placed too far posteriorly. This one can cause trouble with uh, development. It can push on the patient's heart and uh, cause some stress on the heart and on the lungs as well. I won't dig into that any more than that. All right, but pe pectus carinatum is the pigeon chest. Uh, that's that's test worthy stuff right there. Pectus ex uh, excavatum is the funnel chest where the sternum is placed posteriorly. All right, so that's all we're going to worry about for observation. Now let's get to the next topic, which is palpation. Uh, now palpation, you're not like the abdomen. Remember, we did little circles, and then we did back and forth. That's, it's not that type of palpation. It's really uh, a couple of techniques are called palpation. So we have the anterior chest expansion test, which is exactly how we did the posterior chest expansion test. By the way, there's no diaphragmatic excursion that you have to worry about on the front side. Uh, but this, the key with this, even more so than this, if you have bigger hands, you want to grab the rib cage and pull the tissue in. You want to bunch that tissue up in the middle, even perhaps more than she's doing. You can see a little roll of tissue here. And then dig your fingers in and hang on to the chest. Then have them take a deep breath and watch how the thumbs pull apart. And they should be symmetrical. Right? Pretty much how we how we did it for the posterior chest expansion test. Positive finding is if one finger one finger this finger goes out really nicely and this finger doesn't do anything. So it's an asymmetric expansion. You don't measure it with a tape or anything like that. None of the, not even Jarvis has to do that. I don't know where that came from. Um, but it's just a, you watch it and see if there's symmetrical movement. Now, if the patient is symptomatic and sick and not feeling good and they do this, uh, it's a pretty good indication of pneumonia on this lung. The, the the specificity and sensitivity, 
positive likelihood ratio. Remember that? The same as the backside. 44, which is absolutely crazy. I mean, anything over 10 is a significant. Uh, it's very likely to be true. And this is more than likely to be true for unilateral pneumonia. Pleural fusion is pretty good, but the pleural fusion is most likely comes uh, as a sequela of the pleural effusion. Okay. There's some other other indications. Chronic fibrosis uh, might do it, where one lung is stuck. You think that would be bilateral. Uh, bronchial obstruction might do it, uh, but the big one is unilateral pneumonia. So if you have to remember one, that's the one you want to remember. Now, tactile frematis is also considered part of palpation. We did that on the posterior chest, didn't we? Uh, and that's where it should be done, and we did a little bit of the lateral, the costophrenic angles. So CEDL, which is a board book, says don't do this, and I completely agree with that book because we got the cardiac dullness right here. But nevertheless, Bates wants you to do it, and so I'll show you how to do it. It's a modified L pattern. Remember on the back side we had all those spots that you wanted to do. I mean, Bates actually had a double there. Uh, so they just do an abbreviated version. And I would think you want to do this up higher in the first intercostal space. They have you in the second intercostal space here. And you're going to be running into, right, that's the base of the heart. So I would, if, if I was going to actually do this, I would do it up a little bit higher. And you want to use the metacarpal phalangeal joints of your hand. Again, you can also use uh, what we call a knife edge where you can use it. Like if you're karate chopping wood, a karate chop pan, uh, you can put your fifth metacarpal phalangeal joint in these spots. But if you do get asked to do tactile fremitus, you put, uh, you go side to side, only, th only th three places. Uh, so here in the second intercostal space, have the patient say, 99. Repeat over here, 99. And it should be symmetrical. It, I'd actually be worried if it's symmetrical because you got cardiac dullness under here. It's probably going to be stronger over here. So why they do this, I don't know. But then here you go, fifth intercostal space, pretty much in the mid, uh, not quite the midclavicular line, between the midclavicular line and the left and the sternal borders where you're going with this, according to this picture in Bates. Uh, same thing, 99, 99, and then compare out here. Now, this one might actually be useful. It's probably the only one that's useful. Compare these two sides, and it should be the same amount of fremitus. Okay, again, I go on a little rant here. Yeah, Cedal was correct not to do this test. I, I'm hoping they don't ask you to do that on boards. The area, the area of cardiac dullness is... Uh, and the, they can't even agree on this. I've seen, I've seen it uh, second to sixth intercostal space, as well. McGee's second to sixth. It's not a board book though, but that makes more sense to me. Positive finding would be asymmetrical fremitus. Okay, uh, what would decrease fremitus on one side? Anything same, pretty much as we said for the posterior thorax, if there's something that causes an atelectasis and pushes the lung tissue away from the chest wall, in other words, something gets in to the pleural space and pushes the lung tissue away from the chest wall, that's going to decrease the flow, the vibration is going to be stopped. It's going to have trouble transferring from the lung tissue to the chest wall so you won't feel the vibration. And what are things that can cause a, a kind of fill the pleural cavity and push the lung away? Uh, a pneumothorax, if you get air in the pleural cavity, if you get blood in the pleural cavity, if you get pus in the pleural cavity, even if you get a pleural effusion that's isolated to the pleural cavity. Not pneumonia, though. Pneumonia, should I you put that? Uh... Pneumonia would actually make the lung tissue wet, and that transmits sound really good. So you would have an increase in fremitus in someone with unilateral pneumonia. 
we'll even say severe unilateral pneumonia. Okay, uh, neoplasm, if you get that in there. The neoplasm is probably not in and of itself. Well, I guess it could grow, um, but it's going to cause a pleural effusion as well. It's going to irritate the uh, the serous pleural, the cells that make up the, the pleural cavity. Uh, the parietal and visceral pleura are made of cells that secrete serous fluid, and they're going to be irritated, and you'll get a pleural fluid with that, effusion with that. All right, let's get to percussing the anterior uh, and anterior lateral thorax. Uh, so, again, percussion, I don't know why they do this, but uh, we'll go with Bates, the oldest board book. You're supposed to use this pattern right here for percussion and for auscultation. And I can see doing it up here, uh, up in these the apices of the lungs. Um, but yeah, so this is, you're going to percuss. Uh, remember, okay, here's come, just going to challenge my ability to draw. We'll just do one finger sticking out. There's your plexometer, and there's your other fingers. Say this person only has three fingers. Uh, and so you're going to strike the dip right here. You, The key of this is you're going to keep the fingers kind of in line with the ribs. This is a giant hand too, isn't it? But remember to do that. Don't percuss. Uh, don't put your finger like this. Right. Uh, it You get too much rib and you won't get a good note like that. So fingers parallel to the ribs. All right, but that's the pattern. So you would percuss here. Uh, one, two. And then go over here. One, two. Remember how to percuss. And it should be the same percussion note. What's the percussion note? No. It's not tympanic. Resonant. So you should get a resonant note here and here. I don't know about here. You're getting the great vessels. So um, if you go out close to the midclavicular line, Bates says you'll get a normal. It always sounds dull to me. Uh, but percuss here and here. This should definitely be dullness. I mean, so you're right over the heart on three, so I don't know what the point of that is, even when listening for breath sounds. Same with four. But five, you should have a good view of it. And then six, or you should have equal percussion notes when you do these. I don't know about this because, again, the heart is filling the space up here. So, All right, but do the best you can work around the heart. And then remember down here, though, <clears throat> I mean, you're getting the liver dullness uh, is getting pretty close to number four, so that might be dull. Uh, and that might be dull with the heart, so maybe the do dullnesses cancel out. I don't know, but this is the pattern they want you to do. I won't argue anymore with them. Again, organ dullness. Remember, the heart is. We'll go with Bates is between the third and the fifth intercostal space. Right. Make sure you know that. And the liver dullness starts at the fifth intercostal space and below. So the sixth, seventh, eighth intercostal spaces or seventh intercostal spaces should be dull as well. All right. Now we have another one. I don't think you know how to do this. We didn't get to it this time in GIGU. Uh, but there is something called Traub space that we need to percuss to, make, to check. Maybe we can catch splenomegaly. So let's just jump to it. Let me explain it. So this little space right here, that's called Traub space. And I might have been able to draw it over a little bit further here. But this is where the Meganblas would be, or the gastric air bubble. So normally, unless the patient has just eaten dinner, and let me fix this too, because this really should be more like this. Because it should be in... The borders are the inferior part of the sixth rib and the, the axillary line, the mid axillary line, and then the, inter the midclavicular line here, and then the costal margin. So when you percuss that, this is supposed to be not resonant, but tympanic. 
because you have a gastric air bubble really pushing the chest away from that. If you have a full stomach, because your stomach is underneath there as well, stomach and spleen, this might be dull, and that would be normal. This is another one of these tests. I, you know, I wonder really how accurate this is. When we look at sensitivity and specificity. They claim it's fairly high, but I wonder. Nevertheless, we're, the reason you're going to percuss Traub's, the borders of Traub space, especially the mid-axillary line, is to see if the liver or if the spleen is enlarged. Okay. Um, so if I ask you to percuss Traub space, I might ask you to give me the borders, or I may say percuss the the vertical borders of Traub space and tell me what they are. So it's starting at the sixth rib. Starting at the sixth rib right here. You would start right there. Sixth rib. Uh, if you're asked to just stay with the borders, you're going to go down the midclavicular line to the costal margin. That's the medial border of Traub space. The lateral border would be the mid axillary line, still the sixth rib. And you go down. This is the one you want to watch for. Normally, the spleen, and then you can go right through the middle of it too, just to make sure. But normally the spleen is out here. So we'll draw the spleen. Actually, spleen's down here. Normally the spleen would be about here. And it would be way deep. So this should percuss at least resonant, right? But a tympanic because the gastric air bubble kind of pushes it away. People with splenomegaly, the spleen, it doesn't always have to do like this, but the spleen might grow like this. Uh, so even on an empty stomach, when you percuss someone with splenomegaly, you got the spleen occupying this kind of lower portion of Traub space. And so it may start out tympanic up here or even resonant, and then all of a sudden you hit a thud uh, down here in the eighth intercostal space, maybe even up here. It depends which way this, the spleen grows, and they can grow uh, quite big. So that's kind of the story with, with Traub space. All right, a little space there. All right, and there's just, here's another, we can make it a little bigger. Here's another view of what I just said. Uh, so you would percuss down this medial border of Traub space, that's the mid or midclavicular line that but that should be dull. I mean this I mean this should be all tympanic. Sixth rib is here. But here's the key is the mid axillary line. Uh, normally the spleen is tucked back over here. Um, so but in splenomegaly here in the kind of lighter red has invaded. I guess I can draw. It's really nice to be able to draw on these. So the spleen has invaded. Uh, and you may catch it by percussing dull here. So what are the, what's the sensitivity and specificity uh, for this, this Traub space sign, if you will? Uh, Bates says it's moderately accurate. So the sensitivity is 70%, the specificity is 80%. I, that, you know, it's got to really be over 80% to be really clinically useful, in my opinion. Uh, but nevertheless, it's not horrible. It's not like Homan's test or Holman sign, which is what, 30%. It's terrible. Uh, this one's a little bit better for finding. And what are you detecting? You're detecting splenomegaly. That's what this test is for. I mean, if you suspect splenomegaly, you just order an ultrasound of the liver and spleen. Usually the liver is going to be blown up as well, so you can check it on uh, the other side. All right, so that's enough of that. Auscultation, we're going to use that same pattern. But remember, we're not listening for heart sounds. Now we're listening for breath sounds, just like we did over the posterior thorax. Now again, these might be a little bit messed up when you get over the area of cardiac dullness. But nevertheless, I mean, where's that pattern? You're going to auscultate this exact pattern. Now this is fine. The APC, and this is probably the most important one of this test, Pancos tumors and other tumors and conditions, some types of emphysema like to hit up here. So you might hear a difference. 
Uh, you'll have the patient breathe through their mouth. You can have them take a shallow breath in, not a super deep breath, uh, to accentuate. You'll be using the diaphragm. And uh, yeah, uh, compare side to side in that pattern. Did I say, uh, let's see, I should put in here, make sure you use the diaphragm. Oops. Oh, I can't write, can I? Um, I have to get rid of that to do that. So we are going to be using the diaphragm for this procedure. All right. And we covered these last week. So norm, the normal breath sound of the lungs, the posterior, lateral, and anterior, is a vesicular sound, which is a low pitch sound, like rustling leaves, it's said to sound like. Then bronchial vesicular, the pitch gets higher. Where's the picture? Here's the picture. Uh, so vesicular is by far over the most of the lung. Again, I wonder, I think there might be a difference uh, when you listen over the, because of the cardiac dullness here, there might be a difference. So it sounds to me like there's a difference, but Bates and Jarvis say this is the way to do it, so that's the way to do it in that pattern. Now as the pipes get bigger, as so you get to the main stem bronchi, the pitch gets higher, so these are bronchial vesicular sounds are in the second intercostal space. Right over the manubrium, you have even higher pitch sounds, the bronchial sounds. And over the trachea, you have super uh, high sounds, even though we don't, <clears throat> we're not going to auscultate the trachea as part of this exam. Okay, what are we listening for? Uh, the pitch, the intensity, the duration. We're listening for breath sounds is what we're listening for. I mean, really, we're listening for breath sounds and the adventitious sounds. Uh, we covered those. I won't put those in here again, but we covered those last week. So those are all fair game. Uh, rails, ronchi, wheezing. Um, what else did we talk about? Crackles. Yeah, we talked about those last week, so make sure you go back and review those. Uh, procedure. Yeah, everything I said. Have the patient breathe through an open mouth, maybe a little deeper than normal. Did I say using the diaphragm? Let me put that in here again. <laughs> using the... All righty. Oh, there's the pattern right there. Okay, everything I've said. Okay, that's it. Uh, so that's the story. Now, instead of uh, my wife went back to work, so I lost my partner to do these little demo videos. Uh, but we are al allocating one hour for GIGU and one hour for CVP. I'll have a class if you want to come practice your skills or want me to demonstrate for you during that hour. I'd be happy to demonstrate any technique that you want to see and make sure you're doing it correctly. The prostate exam you guys need to pass that. We need to do the full prostate, but um, <clears throat> there'll be you'll get an announcement on that. Okay, so we'll see you guys in the next video.